Uh, I'm beginning a series today about the book of Exodus, and it's called Part One. And I don't know how many parts it's going to take. We, I did my little synopsis on it. I did my pre preliminary work. You know, when you do a Bible study series, a lot of it happens at the very beginning when you have to sit down with your outline and what you hope to accomplish. Now, through the next weeks, I'll be fleshing it out more and making adjustments along the way. One thing I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you how long the series is going to go. I don't want to hem myself in. I will tell you this, that it could be up to a six-part series, but it might end up being five. It might be seven. We'll have to see how it goes. Also, I don't intend to be here for six straight weeks because I'd like to do some traveling. So there will be other Bible studies given in the midst that will not be part of this series, but you, know, you, you can always catch up with the handouts, and I, there won't be a long lag. There's a chance, let's say, like, let's say maybe three of the studies might be before the commemoration of the, the suffering and death of our Lord, it might be before the Days of Unleavened Bread. So that might, you know, Exodus 12, that 12 comes up, all the, the first 12 chapters are before that time. But, you know, there's a lot of chapters left in the, the book, all the way up to 40 chapters. So what the book of Exodus shows us is, what events led up to that original Passover, and then what happened after that original Passover. So what we'll, you'll see is, so it will be most appropriate to cover some things leading up to the commemoration, and it'll be appropriate to have some of the other things afterwards about the commemoration. At the bottom of page one, I'd like to mention this. So you understand my premise. And I've, I've given this before here, and I've given this other places. So when I talk about this premise, you know, you know what my perspective is. You know what my bias is. You know where I'm coming from. See, I like to do that where people can see where I'm coming from. In, the, in this Bible study series, I, I identify two main sections of the book of Exodus. You might identify more sections. Uh, other scholars, other Bible students might ad identify more sections. I'm breaking down the book of Exodus into two main parts. From Exodus 1 through chapter 18 is called Redemption from Egypt. Redemption from Egypt. And that's what I'm going to be covering, that main part. Then beyond that in chapter 2 is, a, is covenant with God, is the covenant with God. So that's how I break down the book of Exodus. That's how, that's how I make it available uh, to, to my audience. So again, there'll be different times covering some of that. But that's going to be the major breakdown. So you'll know, my, you'll know my premise from the very start. I'd like to begin the study by saying, who wrote the book of Exodus? I mean, when any time you talk about a book, you'd like to spend a little time talking about who wrote the book. Uh, most, most people assume and say it was Moses who wrote the book. And I'm going with that theory as well. I'm going to show you why I believe that. Let me show you some biblical references about Moses writing the Pentateuch. Let's look at Mark chapter 12, verse 26. Mark chapter 12, verse 26. Let's see here about why I believe Moses wrote it. Now, there are places in the Bible where it talks about people quoting Moses, that Moses said this or Moses said that. But well, here Christ is saying, he, Christ did that sometimes. Christ would say, Moses said this or Moses said that. But if you quote someone as saying something, that doesn't necessarily prove that they wrote it. So in Matthew 12, verse 26, when he's talking to the Sadducees about the resurrection, if you remember, different individuals came up to him and wanted to uh, trip him up. They wanted, to, they wanted to ask questions they thought he couldn't answer or they thought maybe his answers would embarrass him in front of the crowd. And that's why they asked the questions that they did. So when it came up to the second group, the first group, the Pharisees asked, I mean, the, excuse me, the Herodians asked the question first. Then the Sadducees asked about the resurrection. And they were trying to trip him up on that. He started giving his answer in red letter in verse 24. But we'll, we'll skip down to verse 26. He says, concerning the dead that they rise... Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the book of Moses, in the, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, and then he quoted what he said there. So again, we have indication here that he wrote the book. Also following that in the, 
the same account over in Luke chapter 20. And let's look over, I will turn to John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. John chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. It was interesting in the interactive Bible study, and so we got off into a discussion of, of something that I said. I, we didn't make a lot of progress of where I was hoping to go, but that's okay because I like the audience to participate, and the audience did. I made the statement in the interactive study that I am, and I believe this congregation is a New Testament church that greatly values the Old Testament. That's the way I usually say it. We're, no, we're a New Testament church that greatly values the Old Testament. And some people just, anytime you make statements like that, you have to clarify. You have to define terms. That, that's appropriate to do. And so they started talking about it, how maybe they would, I asked them how they would say it. Would they say it better? Because, you know, if, unless you define the terms, people can interpret what you mean by that. They can interpret, what do you mean by New Testament church? What do you mean by you value the Old Testament? And, of course, we just talked about different ways that could be said because that, that's the way I, I generally say it. I, I, want, I want most of all, when I deal with other people, preach the gospel, I want people to know that I'm a New Testament church. I, I think that's important for them to know that. But I also like the fact that they know that I, I do value the Old Testament, and I think there's great value there. I also like people to not assume I'm Jewish because I do some things from the Bible that the Jewish people also do. Now, why, I could ask you, why would I not want people to think I'm Jewish? The answer is simple. They don't accept Christ as Savior. So thereby, as I've said before, when it comes to political ideology, I favor the Jewish people over the Palestinians. I know Palestinians who are listening to this could think that's unfair, and I understand that. I'm, I'm not, I just favor, I guess I'll talk about the leaders, uh, what the leaders say. That, but having said that, I, I am not Jewish by religion. And I don't want to be thought of as Jewish by religion. So you say, Dave, so you can admire people for being certain ways, but you, yes, I admire them for many ways. But I don't, I don't want people to think I'm a Jewish religion. I understand I keep a Seventh-day Sabbath. It's easy for them to draw that conclusion unless they get to know what I believe. I keep other things that are found in the Old Testament that I value and I think are good, and they can sometimes think that we're part of Judaism, but we're not a part of Judaism. That's not what we do. And so I, I just think, again, if I'm trying to preach the gospel in a, in a good way, if people automatically assume that I don't believe in Christ, they shut down on you. They will not listen to you. And so you, if they will have no way of getting the good things that you, could, you and I could explain about the truth of God, about the way of God, about the Bible in general, which includes the Old Testament. So again, I try hard to show people that yes, I'm, I believe in Jesus Christ as my savior. I believe in the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe in what that entails for the plan of God. And I think again, that is something I wanna project. Now having said that, as someone who values the New Testament, notice what he says here, what Christ says here. He shows that he values the Old Testament. He values the Old Testament. He said, verse 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. If you do not believe my writings, how will you believe, I do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So again, the very fact is he shows that he valued the writings of Moses. But again, it's applied slightly differently. The Sermon on the Mount applies things differently. But again, we look at the Bible, we let the Bible work together, do we, we see what it says? But so again, the fact here, he said, Christ valued the writings of Moses. And I, how it comes into this study, I believe Moses wrote the book of Exodus. I believe he wrote the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I believe he wrote those. And so that's why if someone asked me the question, who wrote the book of Exodus, I believe that Christ did. Now, there's some other references there. There's references that uh, Philip said to Nathaniel. You know, it's on the handout from John 145. Philip said, we have found him of whom Moses wrote in the law. Because Moses wrote about a prophet coming. Moses wrote about a, a, the Christ coming. The prophets wrote about the Christ coming. And what Philip said, he said, I, I saw what Moses wrote, 
And I believe this is the person that Moses wrote about, about whom he wrote. And Paul said the same thing in Romans 10, verse 5. Paul wrote that how Moses had written about righteousness of the law, quoting from the book of Leviticus. So Paul is basically saying that uh, Moses wrote the book, Levit that scripture in Leviticus, that Moses wrote that. So again, we see here from looking at this to see uh, who we believe wrote it. Now there's some references in the book of Exodus. Let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. Doesn't this sound like an old-fashioned Bible study? That's what this is. Except I'm not going to turn to 100 verses like I used to on Wednesday night. Man, we would turn to a lot of verses. I'm referring to a lot, but we'll turn to our share anyway in our allotted time. Exodus 17, verse 14. It talks about, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. So according here, the Lord gave him instruction to write it down. And as he would write it down, then rehearse them that these words should be passed on to Joshua, who would be coming later on. And the Exodus 24, verses 3 and 4, again talks about the same type of thing. Exodus 24, verses 3 and 4. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And the people answered with one voice, saying, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. In verse 4, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. So God told Moses what he wanted. Moses wrote it down, and it was passed on. We see in other parts of the book of Exodus, God will tell Moses, Gather the elders together and tell them this. So there are times he gave oral instruction. He, he gave the oral. He was up at the mount, came down from the mount. And actually, he, wrote the, he actually wrote the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the book says. And he says, tell them what I said. And he would pass that on. Let's look at Exodus 34, verse 27. Exodus 34, verse 27. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he said, Write these words. And if you remember what I told you, my premise in the book of Exodus is, the first half talks about redemption from Egypt. The second half talks about the covenant with God. By the way, you're going to see how this has great application for the New Testament church. Just think of that right there. By the way, too, I'm wanting to cover some of this, not this time, and later on I myself or some of the other speakers will talk about the New Testament symbols. Because quite frankly, I think the New Testament symbols are more important than what I'm giving you today. The New Testament symbols and how we apply those symbols are more important than, we, than what I'm giving you today. But if I give you some foundational points, then some of the other members of the team can focus on the New Testament parts and that whether we use this as a foundation because it's happened years ago, and then we see how Christ taught it and how it was to be applied and how we do apply it today. Now, I do want, for the sake of, of discussion, I'm not into a big discussion about the canon here, but I at least want to bring this to your attention. Turn to Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. The canon is a huge discussion of which, again, like I said, this is just a, a one minor point. But I do know there are sometimes people, when they talk about the translations of the Bible, they get mighty mystical about it. And sometimes people get mighty mystical about the, just the King James Version or the New King James Version or any version. They get mighty mystical about it. And so it's a, it's a, right, it's a fine balance to actually look and see why we value this book but yet we don't get tripped up over every English word. And as we look at this, we have to try to have at least some understanding of how it came together to a canon. We can try to do that in a different discussion. But I want you to look at verse, chapter 12, verse 3. While I believe Moses wrote the book, I believe some people put it together years later and did some editing on the book. Now, someone could say, Dave, are you an expert on that? I am absolutely not an expert on that. But I am this. I don't believe Moses, I don't believe Moses wrote Numbers 12, verse 3. Do you? Look what it says. In parentheses, it says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. 
If he wrote that about himself, he'd be contradicting what he just wrote. If you're the most humble man on the face of the earth, you don't tell the whole world that you're the most humble man on the face of the earth. Okay, make makes sense? But that's just an obvious one. I know when I had Dr. Ernest Martin years ago on the Jerusalem dig, especially on the dig, he went through parts of the Bible, and he would show how certain things were added later. And he would show how certain names were added later or changed later. You know, like in some countries or some, some states, there's actually a, a city that had a name years ago, but they changed the name. And so it looks like at the time when those events happened, a, a name in the Bible had a certain name. But in the Bible, it's, it's a different name later that had been changed to a more modern time. And I don't remember all those. I'd have to go back and see if I still had those notes from Dr. Martin, or I'd have to go back and just do some Google work on it. Any of them can find it out. But again, someone edited it. I don't think that's a problem. I'm not saying it should be a problem. But I think it's a, I, I'm trying to say it's a reality you need to be aware of. So I don't, you don't want to make some broad general statements that don't make you look like a good Bible student. You see what I'm saying? You want to look at some obvious things. So I don't believe Moses wrote that about himself, saying he was the most humble man on the face of the earth. I don't think that's the act of the most humble man on the face of the earth. But having said that, I believe Moses wrote the book of Exodus, but I also believe it was edited later through a combination of individuals. And maybe someday we'll go through that at another time. Okay, so I answered the question, who wrote the book of Exodus? I believe it was Moses, as do most Bible students. I already pointed out to you the two main sections of the book of Exodus, the redemption from Egypt and covenant with God. By the way, you notice on the, right under the bottom of, of the top page, the, the top headline says book of Exodus part 1, and I have down Exodus 1 verses 1 through 8. That's all we're going to get to in Exodus today. Now, we got a lot to cover, but that's all we're going to get to. We're, not, we're just going to cover the first eight verses of the Bible, and we're not going to spend very long on them. Now, if Egypt, if Israel came out of Egypt, a question is, how did Israel end up in Egypt? Does that make sense? If they came out of it, how'd they end up there? Even before that, let's go back to Genesis chapter 32. This is well-known information, but you may have forgotten it, or you may have forgotten where it was found. And most, not everyone knows this. I mean, a lot of people know this when I talk about people who look at the Bible or people who don't look at the Bible, something you learned years, decades and decades ago, and some people have learned it in other denominations decades and decades ago, and other people never learned it. It just depends how much they've studied the Bible. But Genesis 32, verse 28, I want to identify who Israel is. If we're talking about Israel in Egypt, who is Israel? Again, It's not a complicated issue, but it's not one you may have looked at in a while. So since we're covering the book, I thought we'd mention it. Genesis 32, verse 28. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but your name shall be called Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So you've heard of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Of course you've heard of those names. And I mean, like we were talking earlier, even the Muslim religion goes back to, they, they, they look at Muhammad as their main source, and then they go, all, they go all the way back to Abraham. Of course, we don't look at Muhammad as a source of all. We look at Christ as our source, but a lot of people go back to Abraham. But if you go back to Abraham, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's part of the natural history. That's the main history of the Old Testament. But see, if you're talking about, you can either call it Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's where, that's where it is. A simple little thing. But again, if a lot of people aren't aware of that. Now, especially people who don't pay it any time in the Old Testament. If they spend all their time in the New Testament, they don't have a lot of this background information. But you who value both books can have information about both information. Okay, so Israel, Jacob was Israel. Now, Stephen, let's go to Acts chapter 7. And let's look at our time in Acts 7 about how they ended up in, how Israel ended up in Egypt. Have you noticed something as you turn to Acts chapter 7? We're hearing the story of Stephen giving a history lesson. As Stephen's giving a history lesson, what does this tell you about the Old Testament, by the way? 
that Stephen valued the Old Testament, valued the writing of the Old Testament, valued the history of the Old Testament. That's why I say even though we, Stephen, and he, he lived after the death and resurrection of Christ, he learned from the Old Testament. He used that as a foundational piece. You live you lived now after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You also value the Old Testament. So he gives a history. He doesn't tell all the details. And on the handout, not only do I list down what he said, but I have some scripture references to the book of Genesis where you can go back and add more details. So Acts chapter 7, what happened, given, given the background on this, they were, they were giving Stephen a rough time in chapter, the last verses of chapter 6. They were accusing him of blasphemy. They were out to get him. And, you know, when people are out to get you, there's a couple of ways to handle it. If people are out to get you, one way is to kind of melt in, into the background. I was talking to George Crow the other day about something, and I, I reminded him of a verse in the book of Amos. And, the, uh, and he, he said, what is that? I said, there's a scripture in the book of Amos that says, when the evil gets so bad, the prudent man keeps his mouth shut. And because I believe that verse for a long time, and I believe we will follow that even more so in the future. Now, sometimes, quite frankly, I don't follow that yet, I mean, even though there's a lot of evil out there. A simple little thing, a simple little thing. Uh, I compile information called Eye on the World. I, you'd, you'd be surprised what things I don't put in there, but I try to make certain choices I think are good choices to plant some seeds but there's a lot of things I, you know, I don't put in there. And there will come a day when I'll quit compiling it. Because the prudent man will say, well, I think I'm just done doing that. But I'm not done doing it yet. And, but I, I do, even, even, you know, every of those decisions, every of those articles can be critiqued of why I've chosen it. You know, and, you know, you only have so much to do. And yes, if you pay attention, sometimes I put contrasting stories, kind of like what the journal did. The journal would have contrasting stories as they wanted to expose people to certain religious ideas and let the people decide what they believed. That was the purpose of the journal. Different than official Church of God organizations or church organizations, they have their, they have their set doctrine they have to teach. The journal was provided a great service of putting things out there for let people, spotting a light on it and letting people either study it, ignore it, or whatever. Sometimes it, 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 sometimes you look at something and they could defend it better. Sometimes it, they could change their mind. When the sense there, you know, there's some, it may someday I will quit putting things out there. And by the way, the scripture is Amos 5 verse 13. It's Amos 5 verse 13. You can have it later. But I told that because George and I were talking about something. and He was going to write something. And then I said, you know, George, maybe as a lawyer, maybe you shouldn't write that. As a pastor, maybe I can write it, but maybe... Maybe as a lawyer, maybe, not say, Amos 5.13, maybe you should just not be the one putting your name to something like that. And he, he saw the wisdom of it. And he, but again, there's a time when it's just best to keep quiet. And we, maybe, maybe we're well past that time. Or as you feel you're getting closer to that time, you, you keep quiet about things. By the way, not because you're afraid. Not because you're afraid. When it says, be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove... It's because you're trying to be smart. See, sometimes people, oh, you're afraid to say that. Not really. You know, a lot of us aren't afraid of too many things. But then they think, well, but is it really, is it really, necess is it really edifying to do it? Does it really help to do it? Does it help anybody? But so I'm not, I'm not asking you to be cowards at all. I'm just asking you to be smart in what you say or don't say to your family, to your boss, to your neighbors. Not because you're afraid of anything. But you want to be smart. But anyway, he was being accused of blasphemy. And Stephen was not af he wasn't afraid. And he was not very prudent. <laughs> well, the history lesson we're going to learn today was very valuable. It was at the, end, at the very end of it when he said the things he said when he criticized them. <laughs> that wasn't the prudent part. The history part is very good. He basically called them some names. And uh, they didn't like it. They got so, in fact, they reacted emotionally. They had an emo Just like now... He, in, in, around people today, you have to be so careful what you say. People are reacting emotionally. You can say something like Stephen said, whether it be religion, politics, or policies, or whatever. People can react so emotionally today. It's, it, we're f such an emotional society now. 
which I think is being driven by evil influence of spirits, and I also believe it's being done for political reasons of people trying to gain power. Many, many politicians work by generating fear. Let me caution, not only do civil governments try to generate fear, guess what else tries to generate fear? Church governments. Because if they can generate fear, then maybe somehow that, that increases their role in your life or their attempted role in your life. But anyway, having said that, Stephen starts out by giving history lesson. The history lesson verses 8 through 18 involve how Israel ended up in Egypt. Verses 8 to 18, okay? Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac, circumcised him on the eighth day. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. So basically what it's saying here is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, whose name was Israel, and Israel had 12 sons. All Bible students know that. And the 12 sons became envious of Joseph because Joseph had dreams that seemed to elevate him. The dreams were elevating him, and he, he did not use the wisdom. He told his brothers about the dreams, and that just caused them to be envious. What he said, what he said was apparently true. I don't, know if he, I don't remember him misrepresenting a dream, but certainly why did he bring up the dreams? And, you know, why was that valuable for him? But anyway, they were envious. They sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Now, I also have back in Genesis... They actually sold him to the Midianites. The, Midian, the Midianites took him into Egypt. But again, you can flesh that out with the, with the Genesis account and get all that, those details. But God was with him, and God delivered him out of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor of Egypt and all his house. Of course, there's more information in there from the book of Genesis of how that happened. You can read all that. You can cross-reference that. You remember there was a famine and a great trouble came over the land of Egypt and Canaan. And our fathers found uh, no sustenance. And when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent his, he sent his, his, his uh, family out there. And the second time, verse 13, he sent his family. Joseph finally told them who he was. Now, can he, he had, his appearance changed enough that they did not recognize this was their, their brother. But again, you can read that in Genesis. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And of course, when, he, when, he, when, when Pharaoh found out who, these were Joseph's family, he said, come live with us. We'll give you the best land. We'll, give you the best, we'll put you in the best land of Egypt, which is the land of Goshen. We'll put you in that land. So Joseph sent and called his father, Jacob, and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt. And he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought with a sum of money from the sons of, of Hamar, the father of Shechem. Now, I would like to go back on this to go back to uh, Exodus chapter 1. Like I told you, today we're not going to spend much time in the book of Exodus. We spent most of our time in, in the book of Acts, but Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> now, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man and his household came with Jacob. Of course, you recognize the names, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, verse 5, all those who were descendants of Jacob's were 70 persons. That did not include Joseph because Joseph was already there. So that's why just it's listing who was there, listing the family who had come. Now, Joseph died in Egypt. He died there. Now, also says, uh, hold your finger here. I'll go back to Acts 7, verses 17 and 18. When the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until another king arose who did not know Joseph. Because so he's recounting that, but that is said clearly in, uh, look at chapter 
Back to Exodus chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now you know the rest of the story. You know how it works. But even if you didn't know the rest of the story, you could probably figure this out. Okay, they're here and they're strangers. And oh, By the way, I haven't, I, I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to count up everywhere in the Bible where it talks about coming out of Egypt. I, I, I have a guess of how many it will be, but I'm going to read every one of those spots and just to see how huge that lesson is. How huge that lesson of coming out of Egypt is. And so we're, we're going to, you know, you, you're per, pretty much aware of that because you study it every year. But I don't remember the number. I Googled it last night, but it didn't give me a number. So I'm, unless I can find a way to Google it and find it exactly, I'm going to look them up. My, I'll, I'll read every one of them, though. That's just what I like to do when I study a subject. I want to read every place that talks about them coming out of Egypt just to get as much information as possible to, when, we, when we talk about it. But here the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly. They were mighty. The land was filled with them, and then there was this king. There was this king who didn't know Joseph. Joseph's family wasn't important. Joseph wasn't important anymore. I'd like to conclude back in Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, we'll begin in verse 15. Although I'm backtracking just a hair, I want you to see what was said there. I want you to see how he said it, too. Verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they're, here he's talking about that they're, they're worried about it. They're, they're in that room over there if you want to go up there. But so here's uh, Joseph will hate us. He'll, he'll have revenge on us. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and the sin, for they did evil in you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face and said, Behold, we're your servants. Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid, for I am in the place of God. Verse 20, and verse 20 is a very valuable verse to me. I, I hope you'll look at verse 20 as one that can help you in all many areas of your life. Because sometimes when people want to do bad against you, God will turn it for good. Sometimes it happens quickly. Oftentimes it doesn't happen quickly. And even in a few cases, it won't happen until the resurrection. But understand that just when people want to do evil against you, God could make some good happen from it. Because he says, verse 20, For as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about to this day to save many people alive. Don't be afraid. So I want you to take courage there. I want you to look at verse 24. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am dying, but God will surely visit you, and God will bring you out of the land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. God has a plan. God has a promise. God will take you out of this land. So even though that was said at that point, I wonder if when they finally looked back and said, oh, yeah, that's what God said. Oh, yeah, that was the promise to us. Because we have the same situation sometimes. When things are looking rough sometimes, we have to think back to the promises. We have to look at what did he actually promise to us. What promises applied only physically to a nation? And what promises applied to the church of God? And what promises applied to an individual who's trying to live the correct life? I believe the biggest problem in faith is people misinterpret the promises. Because if we interpret the promise correctly, it's as sure as can be. When I see people apply themselves in ways that what I think is not a right view of faith, I think they're misapplying the promises myself. And of course, no one deliberately tries to misapply a promise. But when you're watching from afar, you're watching someone go through a trial, 
Sometimes people will misapply a promise and thereby sometimes they get mad at God or they get mad at themselves and God never really promised that the way you're anticipating it. And so anyway, that's just a, a fr friendly word from, you know, a word from your friend here that I believe people don't understand faith and they misapply promises. But the other thing to realize, if God's made a promise, it may not happen tomorrow. It may happen a decade later. It may happen to your children and grandchildren, or it may happen in the kingdom. But anyway, he promised them a land. They're in this land. They're multiplying. A new king doesn't remember Joseph, and we'll continue next time. If you'll bow your heads, please. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the lessons of the scripture. We love looking at your Bible. We like learning from the history. We like understanding the promises you made to them and see what promises you've made to us. To know those promises can encourage us and inspire us and help us. So, Father, we thank you so much for the study today. We ask your blessing on our dismissal. We ask your blessing on our fellowship. And we look forward to the church service coming up soon. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.